Um, hello, and welcome to my very first uh, YouTube video. I have never done a screen recording like this before, so hopefully everybody can hear me and see what uh, it is that I'm doing in this video. Um, but I thought I would make a video on Advent of Code. Um, for those of you who don't know, every year in December, uh, there's this website, adventofcode.com, that publishes a bunch of programming problems. Um, two per day, every day in December, all the way up to Christmas. So I guess not every day in December, but from the 1st through the 25th. And uh, they're just fun little programming problems and designed to sort of be fun and to teach you something about programming. And since I am an amateur programmer trying to learn how to code myself, I thought I would give these a go and share sort of what I've done with everybody on YouTube. Um, Part of the inspiration of this comes from the fact that I uh, have been teaching myself programming over the past couple years. Again, I'm kind of an amateur programmer. I don't do it professionally. But I learned uh, programming mostly by watching YouTube. Um, and so I wanted to give back a little bit. Um, and in particular, I want to give one shout out to somebody from whom I've learned the most about programming, and particularly programming in Rust, which is the language I'll be using here. Um, and that's uh, this person, John, who is uh, a, a PhD student at MIT, um, doing some fantastic work um, in computer science, but also uh, really involved in the Rust community and puts out these fantastic videos every once in a while, sort of teaching people uh, intermediate to advanced Rust. Um, and I've learned a ton from John and uh, sort of enjoy this format of making videos and watching videos in order to learn. And so I figured I would give back in a small way by doing something a lot more amateurish than he's able to do. Uh, but I highly recommend if you want to learn Rust uh, and you've sort of got the basics down already um, and you're looking for more advanced material, uh, this is a, John's a fantastic resource and go visit his, um, go visit his YouTube page. Um, and check out his projects on GitHub. Uh, he is just a very prolific Rust person involved in Tokyo. Uh, I've helped him out a little bit with this Inferno project, which is particularly interesting. It's a port of uh, FlameGraph, which was originally written in Perl, to Rust. Um, and so this is a neat little project of his that you want to check out, but he's got a whole bunch of others. Um, in any case, uh, I wanted to give John a shout out um, and just say this is the inspiration for making videos. Uh, and I've learned a ton from him. So uh, with that, let's dive into actually solving the first two problems on Abden Code. Oh, I should mention it's December 2nd, so two problems have already come out. I've completed them already, um, but I thought I would start from scratch and walk through sort of my answers. Um, so with that, let's get started. Let's go over to a terminal here and set up our environment. So uh, I'm just in my home folder here in the shell. Let's create a tmux session and name it, let's see, AOC, how about that? Um, let's get some split planes going here, oops. And uh, go over to my lib folder, which is where I keep all of my projects. And let's create a new Rust project uh, to do advent of code. So cargo new AOC 2019, why not? So with this, we've created a new Rust project um, and we cd into our newly created folder. And as you can see, um, cargo new gives you uh, a couple files, the source folder, which is where our code will go, cargo.toml, which I'll explain in a little bit, but it sort of describes our projects and brings in our dependencies. And it also helpfully has created, uh, made this folder a, a Git folder. Um, so when we eventually push our code to GitHub, which we will, um, everything is kind of set up for us. So um, with that, let's also CD on this side into our folder and look at what Cargo has given us. So when you create a brand new project, you get a main file, which is the um, file that Rust will look for in order to run a binary application. Um, so in our main folder, um, they have helpfully provided with a, us with a main function, which is the starting point of your Rust binary application. And 
in this case, uh, our application just prints hello world and then exits. So let's go over here on the right and run our project with cargo run while we're in the folder. And we can see that indeed, uh, it just prints hello world. So this is good scaffolding for us. Um, let's take a look at the cargo.toml uh, file, which describes our project. And as you can see, it's name the package here, version, that's me, author, addition. Uh, one thing I like to add to my uh, cargo.toml right off the bat is publish equals false. So I'm sure I don't accidentally add it to crates.io. Um, we can delete that and we don't have any dependencies as of yet, so let's leave that blank. Um, all right, let's start with what we want our binary application to look like. Well, one thing I know is that I'm gonna want to pull in a package from crates.io um, or a, a crate, in, uh, which is what Rust calls their library. It's called structop, structopt, which is really great for um, getting command line arguments. So the way you pull this in, I know this is all gonna be, I'm gonna sort of vacillate between very basic Rust stuff and more advanced Rust stuff. I don't really know what level to go through, so I'm just gonna keep talking <laughs> about the basics of what I do. But in order to add this to our project, we just copy this little line here and go into our cargo.toml and under our dependencies, we paste struct opt. And let's delete the 0.5 because we really don't care what m minor version of struct opt we have, just anything that is of the 0.3 version will be fine for us. So let's quit out of that and now go back to our main file and let's take a peek at the documentation of structopt to see how we use it. So I'm going to save you having to read all this stuff and let's just copy in the example and bring it over here and paste it into our project. Um, so here is Structopt 101. I guess I should explain first what I'm going for um, and why I'm using this program. So what I want to be able to do is type in the name of my binary and then give it a couple arguments. So for example, the day and maybe the input file. So let's say we don't have this created yet, but let's say we have a data folder and the input to the first day's problem is 01.txt. So this is what I want to be able to run on the command line in order to uh, do the day one problems. And subsequently, as we add more days, day two will be something like this, et cetera, et cetera. So what we can do with structopt is this struct here, this opstruct, decorated with the derived structopt. I forgot what that's called. Um, but anyway, um, there's a whole bunch of macro magic that goes on um, that basically will allow us to put all of the um, arguments and flags and options and things we want in our program here. So we're going to want two arguments. So let me delete this and say we want the day, which we're going to take into as a, as a U size. And that is going to be day. And then the second argument we want is going to be the input file, which we'll call input, and it's going to be, we want to parse it into a path buff, and we don't need any other arguments. Um, we have path buff here, we have struct up. Uh, I also don't want any of this stuff, that's fine. Um, so actually what I want to do is not force you to put in the path of the input file, but in fact to allow you instead of entering something like this to take your input input file and pipe it in over standard input to the program as well. So the way we're going to accomplish that is have this be an option and then um, if the user provides a path then we'll use it. If the user doesn't provide a path then we'll take the input from standard in. Um, so we should make this a um, path to input file. Uh, actually, we should say optional path to input file. If not supplied, will uh, 
uh, read from std in. So this I think is all we're going to need to process command line arguments. So let's save the file over here and then run it over here with the help. Oh, uh, I should mention that when you do cargo run, it will build and run your program. If you want to pass command line arguments to your program when you're just doing cargo run, you do this dash dash and then everything after the dash dash will be actual command line arguments that get piped into your program. So let's call help because with struct opt, uh, we get this automatically. Uh, and as you can see, we get this nice help text. So the name of our program, its version number, usage information, et cetera, et cetera, and the args. Um, so we have a day argument and an input argument. Um, and as you can see, the comments that we've written on our struct, on the members of each struct, um, end up being processed and put into the help text. So we have day is described as day and input is described as optional path to input file if not supplied we'll read from standard in. So that's good. I think that's all we need for command line arguments. Oh, uh, I guess we could actually run the file with we have to give it a day so let's give it a day and we don't have to give it an input so let's leave that blank. So as you can see we're getting the arguments here and then we're just printing them and indeed we have an obstruct where day is one and input is none. Um, so let us uh, add some more scaffolding. So in addition to main RS, I'd like uh, sort of all the functionality of the admin of code problems to be in a library. So let's create a libRS. Um, and for right now, we'll just say pub function foo um, that does nothing. And so in our main function now, to access that, we can pull in our library, um, use AOC. Oh, it's called AOC 2019. And let's just, let's actually give, let's make this do something. Print line called a function from my library. Okay. Now, um, let us call that function. So AOC 2019 foo. Is that what I called it? I did call it foo. Okay. So let's see that run now. Indeed, we called a function from my library. Fantastic. Um, okay. So I guess I should, since I'm doing advent of code, I should actually go back and talk about advent of code. So let's look at the first problem and see what we have to do here. Um, so day one is a whole bunch of text that we don't need to worry about. Um, but the actual problem sort of starts right here. So I'll just read it. Fuel required to launch a given module um, is based on its mass. Specifically, to find the fuel required for a module, take its mass, divide by three, and round down and subtract two. So um, basically what's going to happen if you're not familiar with admin code is you're going to be given puzzle input, which looks like this. It's just a bunch of numbers on each on its own line in sort of text format. And we're going to have to process these inputs. Um, so each of these lines is a quote unquote mass. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how much uh, fuel is required for that mass. Um, so the way this works, they give you some examples of what you have to do. So a module of mass 14, so say one of those lines was 14, um, is the input we're given. And we need to output 2 for this mass of 14. Why? Because um, 14 divided by 2. It, or sorry, divided by three is uh, four. Um, well, once it's rounded down, it's four. And then you subtract uh, two and you get two. 
I'm not being very clear here. <laughs> um, so this is a good example. So here, if we start with, um, oh, am I still on? I'm on day two. Here, I need to be explaining day one. Sorry, or problem, pro problem part one, not part two. So let's say you were given an input of 12, divide by three and round down to get four, and then subtract two, you get two. So for the input of 12, we need to output two. If we have an input of 14, we divide by three and round down, we still get four, and so then we subtract two, we still get two as the answer, so we need to produce two. Uh, I'll do this one more time. For a mass of 1969, you need to divide by three, um, whatever that is, um, and subtract two, you get 654. So you can kind of understand what we're trying to do. So you do this for each line, and then you need to sum up the total fuel requirements for everything, and that is the puzzle answer, which I've already solved, so you can see for me, for my input, it's this. But let's see if we can start sort of coding that. So in our library, let's create a module for uh, day one and add a file called day1.rs somebody's calling me okay um, let's create a function that just runs this and for right now we'll take some input as a string and we'll output our answer as a u size um, so if we had the input, which is going to be here, actually let's copy this and actually get it on our computer. So let's see. Let's create a data folder and create a um, file that includes our input for day one. So there we go. Now we have cat data01.txt, we have our input in a file. Great. Um, actually, before we end up getting a string, let's just do this really naively and just create a run method that opens that file specifically. So we want to file open data.01.txt and this is going to, let's just unwrap everything to begin with that can error, so we also need to pull in use standard fs. Um, so we have a file. Now let's, uh, for simplicity, just um, file read to string uh, unwrap, which will give us a string. And let's just print out that string to make sure we're getting the input correctly. I think read to string requires is part of a trait, so it requires standard dot io or standard io read. Um, so that's our run function in day one for the moment. Um, we're exporting the day one module in our library, and so we should be able to call in our main fi main file day one um, run. read to string is not like that. So uh, let's look up read to string. Oh, it's just a func. Okay, you give it the path. So it's, it's a function in the FS module and you give it the path to your input. So we didn't even need to do the file can just do this. Oh, and we're supposed to be returning the size, so let's return 5. Or no, let's return 42. Um, oh, and we have to run it with our command line arguments. So if you run it with our command line arguments, indeed our all we do is print out the input, which is fantastic. Um, so we have our input, so let's process our input. So input is a string, let's split by 
Oh. Uh, actually, I want to go straight into the right answer for this. So let's do open a file. .unwrap. This gives us a file object. We can wrap that in an IO buffer new file, which is going to be helpful for us. And this needs to be mutable. And then let's start a loop where we uh, take our reader and we read a line into a buffer, which can fail. And this returns the number of bytes read. If it ever returns zero, it means we're at the end of the file. So let's say if it returns zero, then we need to break out of our loop. Um, otherwise, let's just print our buffer to show that we're doing it. And our buffer needs to be cleared after every iteration of the loop. And we also need a buffer. So let's create a new string to act as our buffer and get rid of this. And I think for this, we are going to need the buff read trait. Um, let's run this and see what happens. Oh, we didn't pull in IO. So we need IO. Oh, and we no longer have this. And indeed, we just get are each, we essentially read each line. And in fact, what this shows is that when you read line, right, it pulls in the new line character as well. So let's do trim here. And so now we have, as a string, um, we're getting each line of the file. But we don't need uh, to process, uh, we want to interpret these strings as numbers. So let's say the each for each line we're going to get a number back. It's going to be buffer.trim.parse. We want to parse it into a U size, um, and this can fail. Um, so now we have a number, and let's just print that number for each line and do it again. And indeed, we get the same thing back, except for now we're working with a number. You can see if I just put some junk here and then try and compile it, you'll see that indeed um, we now have a U size instead of a string, which is what we wanted. And the answer to the first problem is really easy. I mean, all we have to do is we, um, it, going back to the original problem, I won't flip back to it, but what we need to do is we need to take this number, uh, divide by three, uh, round, down, round down whatever answer we get, and then subtract two. Um, so if we take n and we divide by 3 like this, because we're working with integers or an unsigned integer, this is going to do the rounding down for us. And then we subtract 2. Um, but I'm a little bit worried that, you know, if we end up getting, if this ends up being like 1, for example, subtracting 2 is going to um, like overflow. So we don't want to overflow. Let's do a checked sub which means that we can, uh, which is going to return an option. It'll either return sum of the number if it worked, or if it was going to underflow, it'll return none. So we get an answer out, which is M. If it worked, if it's none, it means, you know, we would have gotten a negative number, which is not possible. So let's just say we got zero. And let's say this is the answer for here. Um, so let's print out not the input, but let's print out this answer m for each line and see what we get. And indeed, we've gotten different numbers. In fact, these are the answers. And all we have to do now to complete the answer to the question is we have a total that we initialize to 0. And then every time we get an answer, let's increment that total by m. And down here, we can print out the total, and that should be our answer. And indeed, 
3,271,095, I think is the right answer to number one, uh, which is right here. Yeah, indeed, that's correct. Um, so this is what we want this function to return, actually. So we don't have to return 42 anymore. So if we go back to our main function, we can say that the answer to part one is returned by this run function. And let's just print it out. I don't know why that RLS is working up, uh, is acting up, and so that's why that error on the import was there. Um, but if I just quit and restart them, RLS will work. So let's run this one more time, and we should get the exact same thing. Perfect. So that is the answer to part one. Um, but we're not using the input that we're getting from the command line arguments at all. So what we run to do is use that input. First of all, um, I guess we should figure out if the user gave us in the command line arguments a path. So let's match on opt.input. And this can either be some path or it can be none. Um, if it was indeed a path, then what we want to do here, uh, how should I explain this? So this run function, we want it to take the input, right? Um, but if you've noticed, we're using the fact that we have a buff reader in order to read each line. And so it'd be nice actually if we got this input as a buff reader. So we want the input to be anything, any, any generic thing, as long as that thing is satisfies the buff reader or the buff read tree um, and our run function. And so that way we can do away with this and this and this and the input is what we'll use to read a line. Uh, and we're no longer using buff read anymore. And the problem that we have now is we can't borrow. Read line requires borrowing the reader as mutable. So all we have to do is say, well, when this input comes in, let's make that, we don't need FS anymore. Let's make that a, uh, a mutable binding to input. So now our run function takes input and gives us the answer. So let's use it here day zero one run while we have the input. Um, but we don't really have the input as a buff reader yet. But this is going to be our answer. Um, so let's take the path and turn it into a buff reader. So we open this path. This can fail. We um, create a buff reader out of that. returns a file and we pass the reader there and now we need some imports and we don't need that anymore and let's just print out our answer here All right, so now that we have a program like this, we should be able to say cargo run, I want day one, and I want to, as input, use 01 data, uh, I want to use this 01.txt file. This should work, and it does. But what we can't do, let's say we build this instead of running it. So now that we built it, 
Uh, I, by the way, I have um, Rust lets you set a custom target directory for uh, your build artifacts as a um, environment variable, and I have that set to home BC minus target. So if we look in uh, my home folder under target debug, uh, let's see, we should have in here a an AOC 2019 binary. So let's do cargo build and uh, cargo target dir just to make this super generic. Uh, we want to uh, run AOC 2019. If we run that with day one and data slash 01.txt, How does this work? Oh, let me do debug. There we go. This should work. But the problem is what we want to be able to do is pipe this in on standard in as well. So if I cat data.01.txt and I pipe that in, this is going to run into our unimplemented because we haven't supplied the path on the command line, we instead are piping it in through standard n, and right now we can't handle that. So let's handle that scenario as well. So if we do not get our, our input file path passed in as a command line uh, argument, we need to read from standard n. So let's get a handle to standard n, which in Rust you do like this. For good measure, let's lock standard in. And with this guard, we can now wrap that in a buff reader. Well, it actually is a buff reader itself. The, the, this type, uh, let me show you what this type is. This type is a standard IO, standard in lock, which uh, if we look at the documents, also implements buff read. So we can pass this directly to AOC 2019 day01 run guard. And we should get an answer there. Let me just copy it. And now this should work. If we pipe our input data in on standard input, and we leave off the second argument, we should still get the same answer, which we do. This is wonderful. All right. But right now we're sort of totally ignoring the day argument. So I could put in, you know, day 45 here, and it would still work, which is obviously not what we want. So um, really what we want to do is we want to match on opt.day. And if that's one, we want to do all this stuff. If it's, well, anything else, I guess there's a couple scenarios. If it's anything else, and anything else is greater than one or less than 26, then we want to say, I'll just panic for the moment not this day is not yet implemented. Or really we can say day whatever it was them go to the end of the line, thank you. Is not yet implemented. However if it's anything else, meaning it's some number that is, well, either if we get zero or if we get something 26 or above, then we want to panic and say, you know, the day must be between one and 25 inclusive. Uh, 
Um, oh, and I said here, we'll make this a lot cleaner in a bit, but I said if it's day one, we want to do all this stuff. Um, so if we run this now with day 45, it should panic and say day 45 is not yet implemented, but that's not correct. Oh, not or, and. If the day is between those two things, then we say, um, all right, so with 45, we get day must be between 1 and 25 inclusive. But if we do a day that actually is a valid advent of code day, it's just one that we haven't done yet, like say day 20, then we get day 20 is not yet implemented, which is great. Um, but this is kind of messy. Like, I don't want to have to, for every day, parse the input and do this. Like, say we have, I mean, we're going to do day 2 later. Um, so let's say if you're given day two, I don't wanna to have to repeat all of this stuff here for day two. So what I really wanna do is I want to say let input equals this and have it say return the reader um, here. And then if it's day one, I want to do AOC 2019 day 01 run with the input. And if it's day two, I want to do AOC 2019 day two run with the input. Uh, now, this is not going to work, which is the first sort of fun thing that I wanted to get into with this video that has nothing to do with having a code, and it's more about Rust. In fact, a lot of what I'm gonna do is not, these problems are really simple. Um, the, the thing that I wanted to get across with this video is how to sort of set up you know, Rust to work very efficiently with command line arguments, which takes a bit of doing in this case. Um, First of all, we get this error that we don't have a day two module and a run function. So let's just sort of fix that real quick. Let's make another module day two. And we'll have a different module for each day. And then we, let's see, add day two dot rs. And for right now, we just need a run function that again, takes a reader and outputs Well, let's not have an output anything, actually. Um, so where R is IO buff read. So use standard IO. Use standard IO. And we'll just make this unimplemented for the moment. Oh, and I'm missing function. And you're gonna give me a warning there, so let's say ignore that argument. All right, so now at least we have, oh, uh, let's also make day one not return a u size. The run function for each day should not return anything. It should just print the answer to standard out. So now, we should only have one error. So these these functions both return unit, um, this function and this function, and so that should be fine. But we still have an interesting error, so let's run and see what our error is. So um, we're trying to assign to the variable input um, a buff reader, but a buff reader is not a concrete type, it's a trait in Rust. Um, and so actually what we're returning, in fact, let's look at the buff reader documentation. Sorry, buff reader is a concrete type. I, I misspoke. Buff reader is a concrete type, but is a concrete type that's generic over what it contains. It's generic over a reader. Um, and so here we're trying to assign the input. This is a buff reader that wraps a file. And this is, well, let's make this clear. IO buff reader. 
new guard. And this reader equals reader. This is a reader. This is a buff reader that wraps a uh, standard in lock guard. So they're not the same type. And Rust is not going to let us try to assign two different types to this one variable, which is going to create an interesting problem for us. Um, but I really like how this is set up. I would really like to have in my main function, like the processing of the input like that, and to be able to get like a, an input type here that I don't have to worry about whether or not it came from a file or whether or not it came from standard in. Um, and so this is the first sort of tricky thing that we need to solve or that I'd like to solve to make doing advent of code problems from here on out like a lot easier and how we can have these, these sort of two ways of inputting our data either as an argument, a command line argument or as reading from standard in. Again, none of this is sort of strictly necessary and not really about advent of code, but I just think it'd be nice to show how you could do this with uh, sort of command line applications in Rust. So in order to do this, what we need to do is make this input function be a concrete type that is the same type if we take this path as it is if we take this path. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to come into my library. I'm going to create a module called reader. I'm going to create a new type called um, reader. It's going to be an enum. And it's either going to take, it's either going to be, contain a file, or it's going to contain a, let's see, standard in, it's going to contain an IO STD in lock, which to go back here, std in lock. An std in lock is a concrete type, but it wraps a generic lifetime tick A. So we need to include that here, which means we need to include the lifetime here. Um, and we need to pull in the right, we need standard fs. And we need standard IO. So we have this enum that can either contain a file or it can create it contain a standard in lock, right? Um, but, and we want to be able to create one of these readers. We want this to be one of these new type of readers that I've created. Um, and we want to be able to pass it into our run functions. But our run functions, as you recall, take something that implements IO buff read. Our type of reader. This reader does not implement IO buff read, but we can make it implement IO buff read like pretty easily. Um, so if you go to the buff read trait, the buff read trait, uh, well, first of all, we know that in order to implement buff read, we have to implement read. So we actually have to implement both buff read and read on our reader trait. Um, but in order to implement buff read, in addition to having to implement read, the required methods are this fill buff, fill buff method and consume method. So if we want to implement IO buff read for our new reader, and get this generic lifetime in there, we will have to implement this function, this method, as well as this method. Um, and we said that we also have to implement IO read on our reader. So let's implement IO read. And for IO read, I think the only function we need, well, let's look it up. Uh, so for IO read, the only function we need to implement for it to actually implement that trade is the read function. So let's have our reader implement read. Um, and now we have some errors because obviously we're not doing anything in these functions. We need to return the right thing. But what we can do here is just say, what type of reader are we? Well, if we're a reader 
file, actually let's use self file, because that's something you can do new in Rust, and we wrap a file, well, we need to take that file, we need to create a buff reader over that file, And then let's just call reader. Let's just call um, read. Well, actually, file implements read. So all we have to do is do file that read, and give it the buff. If, however, instead of a file, we are the standard in type of reader, then we have our guard in here, and our guard implements read as well. So we can just do that. And that should work, except for this is not a regular result. This is an IO result. So now our reader implements read. Um, and all we did was we know that our reader is either going to contain a file or it's going to contain, contain the standard in lock. And both of these implement read. And so we just delegate to like the inner types sort of read in order to have read be implemented for our type. I know this is confusing. Hopefully everybody's following me. <laughs> but uh, but uh, like I said, I've never done a video before. Um, and I'm just sort of talking. Um, we can do the same thing with buff read. We can sort of say, what type of reader are we? Well, if we're the one that contains a file, um, then in order to implement buff read, all we need to do is wrap ourselves in an IO buff reader. And then that reader will have available to it the fill buff method, uh, which we just call, this is also an IO result. If, however, we are, um, an std in, then we get a guard, and the guard implements buff read, I think, itself. So we can just call directly fill buff. And that should work, except for we cannot borrow mute reader is mutable, so let's just make this mutable. Cannot return value referencing local value reader. Hmm. Not sure why that's not working, but we'll get back to it in a second. Let's do the same thing for consume. I think the problem, let's do unimplemented for now, because we need to solve this problem. Cannot return local value. Oh, I see. So what's the problem here is the lifetime of this, of what we're returning, is tied to the lifetime of uh, our s the thing that we're calling fill buff on. And here we've created a reader on the stack. And then we try and call fill buff on it. It was, it was going to return something that is a pointer to this item that's on the stack. And then as soon as this 
as soon as we end here, reader goes out of scope and so is destroyed. And so now we have a pointer to something that is no longer there. And so really what we need to do here is this file needs to be an IO buff reader of an FS file. Um, and so we need to call, this is the, this is a reader in and of itself. And we need to do that. So the reader needs to be created. The reader needs to continue to live, which means we need to create it before we get into this function here. Um, so we will fix that. Uh, well, we'll go with that. Hopefully I explained why that needs to happen. All right, so for consume, um, this is now a reader, not that the name really matters. We can just call reader.consume amount. And here we can just call guard.consume amount. Not consumer, consume. Um, and so there we go. We have a type, a concrete type, reader, that um, implements read and buff read. And so if we create one, so if we use this, if we use this, if we somehow end up having this be our reader type, then it's going to be happy with us because this will be our concrete type reader and this will be our concrete type reader and both of these match arms will return the same thing and so there will be no more problems here about match arms having incompatible types. So what we want to do, let's go back here. So. Um, well, first of all, let's be able to use our reader. So let's say pub use self reader reader so that we export our newly created type from, uh, we can delete this, I think, from our library. So if we go to our main function, um, we have an AOC reader now. Oh, we also need self but we've, we, we have access to our reader. And our reader can either be, uh, I guess it was the file reader type, or let's not, we don't need that anymore. We can have the STDN reader variant, which takes a guard. And so now, um, all of this just works, except for we have the same problem of this reader contains a pointer or a reference that has a lifetime um, because this guard is a type that is um, generic over a lifetime. The lifetime it's pointing to, or the lifetime it's referencing, is the lifetime of this standard in variable which goes out of scope at the end here. So we can't use this after standard in goes out of scope. So what we need to do is pull this out here. And now uh, our reader, this is now, let's say, let's show you what this type is now. Um, so we input is now an AOC 2019 reader reader that is generic over a lifetime. Um, and it's the same type here as it is here. And so we can return it from these two different match expressions and put it in this local variable on the stack here. And all of that's fine because even though our reader is parameterized by a lifetime, this, th this thing, which is really the thing that needs to live long enough such that we can use it is going to live long enough such that we can use it. Um, and oh, by the way, this reader is implements read and it implements buff read, and so we can put it into our run function. Um, so let me take this type thing off so that it actually works again. And there you have it. Uh, we have the ability to parse our command line arguments in such a way that all of our 
all of the run functions from the various different days will do. So one, two, three, four, all the different days. All we have to do is create a run function that takes this generic uh, buff read. And it'll work whether or not we pipe the input in through standard in, or it'll work whether or not our um, user has provided a command line argument for the input file. Um, and it did take a little bit of doing to create this sort of wrapper type of reader. Um, but now that we have this built, it's super easy to use and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and so hopefully you can see that this is a nice clean sort of way to structure a command line um, application in Rust in order to have the flexibility we want and to make it easy to create run functions for all the various days, like for any day we want. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is instead of panicking, I mean we could panic, but why not use like nice error types? So let's make, well, let's change this to be called run. Uh, I'll show you why I'm going to do this in a second. And let's just delegate let's make our main function delegate to run. But run, let's have return a result because things can fail here. So it's either going to return nothing or it's going to return an error. Um, we don't have an error type yet, so let's just create an error type. Um, oh, uh, yeah. And instead of panicking here, let's have this return an error. And now we have to return a result of OK. Oops. Return error. Why? Oh, return the error variance of error. So now this run function is happy, and this is not happy because this returns a result, and main returns just unit. And so what we really want to do here is say if let error e equals run, then we're going to do something with the error. Like say e print line the error, which we can't do yet because this does not is not printable. All right, so now if we get an error, um, then we're going to print it to the print to the command line in our main function. Um, and for good measure, let's exit with an error code, which requires use standard process exit. Um, so we have sort of our the actual main function that does all the work right um, which returns a result but then well we have a a kind of main function that does all the work and returns a result but then in our real main function um, we just check whether or not that was an error and we sort of print it nicely to standard error and we exit with an exit code one um, I mean panic basically does the same thing but I just kind of wanted to show you how you could do this with errors instead um, so error doesn't need to be part of the main. Let's make it part of our um, library instead. So let's create a new module called error and just stick our error in there for the moment. It'll have to be public and we need to export it. Oops. And so back in our main function, we need to pull in error which we just moved to the library. So now if we run something like this with 45, it should print error. Um, I hope everybody's following that. So our error type, we want to not just, we want to build out like a proper error type for Rust, which is totally unnecessary for this, but again, it's just kind of to show you 
like if you were building a real command line application, like what you would do in order to sort of make it pretty and use proper error types and error handling and stuff like that. So in order for this to be a proper error, we probably want it to implement standard error error, um, which has no required methods. But the only thing it requires, well, actually, if we look at it here. So in order to implement standard error error, um, you have to all you have to do is implement debug and display, and there are no see how there are no required methods. But the thing that we're missing that makes it so our t our error type does not implement standard error to error is it doesn't implement display. So let's make it implement display. you do like this implementing a script display requires that you implement this function which takes a mutable ref uh, mutable reference to a formatter and returns a font result and at the moment we'll just have it write Hello, I'm I'm an error to the formatter, and we need to pull in obviously standard font into the namespace. Oops, and this is a macro. Oh, and we need to implement standard error for error. There we go. Now, if we do this again, um, our error should. Oh, we're doing the debug. Oops. We're doing the debug. We're printing out the debug uh, version of our error. So let's print out the display version of our error because it now implements display. And we should get the. I'm an error text that we said. Hello, I'm an error. Great. Okay. So now we have a, a proper error type. Um, let us build this out a little bit more and say, actually, this is an enum. And the only variance right now we want is a custom variance, which is going to hold a string. Um, and so in display, let's match on what type of what what match on which variant of error we are. And if we're a custom error that holds a string, then what we're going to do is we're going to write to the formatter um, the display version of that string, and that's all we do for display. So um, that means when we created the errors down here. We can just create an error like that. We have to give it a string, like foo to string and uh, custom bar to string. So now, if we run this, um, we should get bar because we hit the bar error case. If we hit the foo error case with say try and do 20 instead we should get foo great that's wonderful but this is kind of a pain in the ass to write return error error custom foo to string blah 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 so there's a couple interesting macros you can always add to uh, your crate uh, your custom error well let me just build them and you'll see why they're useful I mean this is totally unnecessary but again if you were sort of building out a real library a real command line argument this is the kind of sort of nice ergonomic stuff that you'd like to have. And what's nice about it is you can write it kind of once. I mean, I'm rewriting it all from scratch, but you can write it once and then just always have it available to you to use in all your projects. So I want to create a macro. So let's create a new um, Rust file called macro. And let's uh, bring it in here, mod macro. Let's call it macros, actually. Um, I'll go back 
the loop. So we have mod macros and let's um, do macro use because we're going to have some macros in there and let's get around to defining macros. So the two macros I want to write are much like the print macro in Rust. Um, they're very close to what the print macro looks like. So I'm going to steal this code. The print macro in Rust looks like this. Except for ours, we're going to call it error. And we're going to export it. Macro export. This is kind of like the pub use for macros in Rust. Um, but what we're going to do is we're not going to we're not going to print the arguments. We are going to create a uh, create error custom, and out of that custom, we are going to format display traits of the format args of all this business. And I think, oh, we got to close that parenthesis. To close that parenthesis, I think this will work. Let's see if I got it, if I got all the parentheses correct. So now, instead of writing, instead of every time we want to create a new custom error, we don't have to write error custom foo to string. Instead, we can just write error uh, foo. And we can even do this. We could do error Foo bar. This is now available to us, which will create a custom error, but it's now sort of like the print line macro or the print macro in Rust, where it's like super ergonomic and super easy. I think. Um, we want to create one more macro, which is super useful, and you should sort of have handy in your toolbox, which is the bail macro. And all this is going to do is instead of giving us an error, it is going to return that custom error wrapped in the error, um, wrapped in the error uh, variant of result. And so this allows us to, in our main function, come back down here and instead of saying return error all this mess we can just say bail bar and here we can say bail foo um, and of course that's not working because we need to bring in we need to import bail but that should just work now I think do we have any errors anywhere um, so if we run this again with on day 20, it gives us the foo error, and on day 45, it should give us the bar error. And we have this nice, clean code using results the way they should be without panics, and we have like a simple way of just creating an error. And another, another example here, instead of that, we can do 42. So we can use the bail macro this way as well, just like print line, and uh, it gives us 42. So let's put the text back in here that we wanted. So if if we error this way, we wanted to say something like uh, this is um, day must be between. 1 and 25 inclusive and this error was day 
something is not yet implemented. And that something is in. Um, so what this bail macro do, will do for us, as you can probably tell, I'm just summarizing again, is um, it creates uh, a custom variant of our own error type and it returns it. Um, that's like a fancy way to make errors easy, but still have your own like real error type and use all the power of Rust error handling. Um, the other thing I want to do with errors, because I saw I saw somebody do this in a crate. Actually, I'll, this is really fairly new to me. But um, you guys have to see my bookmarks for just a second. I don't really want to share my bookmarks with you, but whatever. Um, so I saw this crate the other day that's an example of a basic HTTP server. And in their main function, they have this neat little function, log error chain, which um, I don't think we're going to have any errors that have like causes and those errors having causes, but like a whole chain of errors. Um, but that's possible with the, the, the source function on standard error error. And this is a neat way to not only print out the main error, but to print out all the errors that that error was caused by. And so let's like pull this into our code as well. Um, so what we do to do this is let's see here, if we, if we do the run function and we get an error, this is gonna be our own error type, which implements standard error error. So let's say, let's, let's, um, Re, let's cast it, cast is probably not the right word, uh, to a reference to a standard error, error. Um, and this is gonna have to be mutable. And well, first of all, we wanna print this. And then let's just say while there is a cause, or while there is a source to our error, let us, print out, uh, let's say, space space d caused by um, source. And then let's set e to the source. And I think this will work. Eight objects uh, and, and, oh, this needs to be done. Um, and that is a way to get this error reporting including the cause chain um, which is basically what this guy did except for instead of having a function that's just in my main function here um, but that's why I sort of pulled that's why I, I created these two functions here the run function where we just deal with regular rust errors like they're supposed to be and this main function that if an error ever propagates to the top of our crate, we print it, but then we also print through this neat little while loop and standard error error trait object mess, like the causes, and we exit with one. So I think that's pretty neat, and I wanted to like show that off. Um, but right now we have uh, we've essentially finished, I think, with all of the sort of infrastructure to have a nice little project that we can use as a base to keep doing all the various days of advent of code, uh, which is what I really wanted to show you, which is all this sort of Rust mechanism that to get like a really nice command line interface, interface in place. Um, but I guess we can switch gears now and actually <laughs> focus on doing advent of code. Um, so let's do that. Um, so day one, we solved part one, and here's the answer. Um, so, but we have some unwrap business in here, which is not great. So instead of unwrapping that, let's have this return a result of, well, nothing, or our new error type. So we pull that in here. And when this is done, it's gonna return okay. But instead of unwrapping these errors, let's propagate them if we run into them. Ooh. 
which is great. Except for we get a couple of errors here, and I'll show you what those errors are. So input.readline, this first function here, returns an IO error. But we're trying to return our own error type. And you can't convert an IO error as of the moment into uh, our own error type, and so we're getting this error. Same thing with the uh, parse function. The parse function returns a result that could be a standard num parse int error, and that is also not convertible into our error type. So we have some problems. So let's just make, uh, let's solve those problems. Let's go back to our error. And uh, error handling in, in Rust is a little bit verbose because if you want to use one error type that sort of encapsulates all of them, you, you keep having to do this over and over again, but it's really not that bad. All we have to do is on our error type, implement from these other error types and then we'll be good. Uh, so we want to be able to convert from a standard IO error. I don't need the standard. Um, for for our error, and all we do need to do is implement from where the this is an IO error, and we turn self. And what we're going to do is we're going to create another variant on our uh, error struct to contain an IO error. So this is going to contain an IO error. Oh, we don't have IO. Um, which is fine, but this should be yelling at us, and I don't know why it's not. Let's see if it'll yell at us if we actually build. Oh, it's because the other error is yelling at us. So let's add that too, and then I'll fix. But you guys can probably look at this and see what error is going to come up. But let's uh, let's add the parse uh, int error variant as well, and this is standard num parse int error. So we want to be able to have our error um, contain one of those. And so we need another from implementation. You see there's a little bit of boilerplate involved with this, but it's not too bad. Um, there are many different error crates in Rust that have tried to like solve this problem for people. Uh, the most notable which is failure, which I'll show you in a second. But um, for reasons that I don't quite understand, people are not entirely satisfied with failure. And so the recommendation is don't use it um, anymore, <laughs> um, at least I think. Uh, so that's why I'm not using it. But I used to use failure all the time, and it was super easy. Um, but again, sort of use it your own risk, because I think it, it has some problems with it that I don't fully understand. But this is a crate that got rid of a lot of this boilerplate for you. Um, but also, I don't know, it is not really used anymore. So now our only problem is when we, when we implement display here, we're only implementing display on one of our variants and our error now has three variant types. So we need to make sure that we are implementing it for all of our variant types. This contains an error and parse int contains an error. And all we have to do is just delegate to those inner errors, the uh, displaying of themselves. So now if we run this, we should have no problems except for uh, we changed day one to return a result, but we didn't change day two to return result. result. And so now these match arms are returning different types, which you can't do. So this is super easy to fix. All we have to do is say this also returns a result of unit type and our error, which we need to pull in our error. And now it should work. Uh, unused result that must be used. Oh, yeah, of course. We're not using the result down here, but we should. We should now propagate this because it can fail. All right, so now we should have no warnings. Good. Now we can finally get around to actually doing advent of code. <laughs> After all of this stuff to just set up the infrastructure, which is really what I wanted to stream about because I think that solving sort of these problems is, is relatively easy in Rust. But if you wanted to 
do it in a very, very robust way that sort of gives you practice on creating your own like sort of fully baked command line applications or libraries. This is the kind of sort of infrastructure that it's helpful to understand in Rust to create something really polished. So that was really the focus of the stream, but um, now that we've done it, let's go ahead and solve the rest of the advent of code problems. Um, so let's see. So advent of code day one, let's go back here. We solved this first problem where we just have we just have these lists of numbers, lists of numbers as input, and we have to divide them by three, subtract two, and then sum them all up. That's fine. Um, the second problem on day one, there's always two problems for each day. The second problem, I won't read it to you, but basically what it is, is it's saying, okay, um, instead of, well, actually, I'll read it to you, because <laughs> it's probably easier to explain that way. Um, so each line was, each line of our input is a module, which has a mass, um, and we calculated that before. But now they're saying that the the um, we get the mass of the fuel. That was what we were getting to before. But now they're saying the fuel itself also requires fuel, and that fuel requires fuel, and so on and so on. And so basically, we have to do this. We have to do this calculation recursively. And uh, I don't know, you guys can read the problem. I'm bad at describing it, but I'll just sort of solve it for you and, and then uh, we can figure this out. So really what, what, what we need to do is um, each line is a number, which we get here, right? And there's gonna be two ways to process that number to get sort of the, let's call it fuel, I guess. The fuel required, so um, let's just say Let's abstract this a little bit. Let's say part one fuel takes in and does this stuff. So all we did was we took whatever, we took this part of our code and we turned it into a function. And that works for part one. Um, for part two, we're gonna do something to that line that's slightly different. We are going to, uh, in a loop, do all this business. And that's gonna give us an answer. Let's call it M. Um, and we're going to have a little running total in here too. Um, so we need to add M to our total uh, fuel that's required. But then the fuel itself requires fuel. And so we're just going to say N equals M and continue the loop. And instead of the where we break from the loop is whenever we end up the fuel ends up needing zero or negative. And so instead of uh, instead of this match arm when it when it sort of goes to zero or negative, just giving us a zero, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break from this loop and we're gonna end up returning the total. Um, and that's the answer to number two. Um, I'm explaining it terribly. Um, but the only the only thing is so n is this variable that we're reassigning to and so it needs to be mutable. Um, and so there we have how part two works. So everything about part two is the same. Like you take in the input, you loop over every single line. For every single line, you get the input as a number, and then you do this function on it, which gets you the fuel. You increment your total by that fuel amount, and then like you print out the total after you exited the loop. Um, that's the answer. The only thing is we need we need to be able to you know put part two in here if we want to run number two. So instead of uh, like you know reusing code and all that stuff, let's just make this run function take a func uh, that's f 
uh, which we can tell we can tell it via parameter which one to run. And so f is going to be some sort of generic parameter, which is something that implements the fn from u size to u size trait. And so now we can call run. Well, we're calling run from the main code with just passing it the input. And so what we really need to do is we need to call this uh, run part. And our actual run function will have the same signature as before. Um, and what we'll do in here is we'll, we'll sort of run part on the input with part passing in the function part one. And that should This should work for part one. And why, oh yeah, because this needs to be where R is IO buff read. And this does not need to be mutable. So now this should work the exact same as before. Let's type in day one. Um, and we get the right answer um, for part one. Let's do part two. Now this is not going to be right. Um, well, it's not going to be right because as you can see, we've moved input into this function. And so input is no longer alive after we exit this function. So we can't use it again. Um, so in order to be able to use it again, instead of mute input, instead of input being a buff reader, let's make it be a mutable uh, thing that implements buff read. Um, and so let's pass in a mutable reference to it so it'll stay alive afterwards, which means this needs to be mutable. And that'll work, but not really. So let's run it again and see why it doesn't work. So it's going to, for day one, it's going to return the right answer. For day two, it's going to return zero. And this is because, so what we're giving run part is a something that implements buff read, but let's say in the case, in either case, whether or not we give it a buff reader that's wrapped that's wrapping a file, or we give it a buff reader that's wrapping uh, standard in uh, lock guard. Once this function runs, right? It's 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 already read all the input, and so it's gonna the second time you do run part right here, it's gonna say okay I'm gonna start looping, and then it's gonna try and read a line, and it's gonna it's gonna immediately return zero and break because you've already sort of run through that you've used up the buff reader, right? <laughs> Which is not good. Um, so the way we can fix that is we can just say I mean I'd like to it'd be nice if we could have, if we could use the buff reader again. There's probably a way to do that. Um, but for right now, all we're going to do is we're going to read all of the input data into uh, like a vector of bytes. Um, so we have it and we can reuse it again. And the way to do that is just to say, uh, let mute input, or let's call it contents equals vec new. And then we are going to take the input and we are going to read to end into this buffer. So now we have, um, that needs to go like that. I'm surprised I can do that without needing read in scope. But anyway, now we have the input is in a vector of bytes. Um, and so our new input, let's call it reader, let's just wrap a new buff reader Let's just wrap that input in a new buff reader. So if we do content, I think a buff reader can take a slice of U8s. Um, so let's, instead of passing in input, let's pass that in. And we have to do it again to create a brand new buff reader that's not used up um, for part two. 
Oops. Um, and it'd be helpful if I could spell content. We can't borrow the reader is mutable because we need to needs to be bound as mutable. But now this should work. So let's run it again and see if it gives us the right answer. And it does. Um, this we already saw was the answer to number to part one. And this is the answer to part two. 4,903,759. 4, 4,903,759. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think maybe there's a way to like if we wrapped our input in a cursor, then maybe we could just reset it to the beginning and not have to read the whole thing into, into memory. Um, because before we were just sort of streaming it in, but uh, I'll have to think about that. For right now, this sort of works, although it's a little bit sad that, I, I actually think it might, because we're running over the data twice, we might have to do this, um, but it's a little bit sad. Anyway, that's that's sort of part one done though. Um, we could add some tests too, um, which I did in my other file, but uh, because this is already going on, how long have I been recording for? Uh, where does it say? Oh, I've been recording for an hour and a half. Um, so why don't we just leave it at this uh, on part one, uh, day one, and I'll do day two in another video. Um, but there you go, this is a little bit of rust to, um, a lot of setting up infrastructure to make doing subsequent days of uh, advent of code easy. And a lot of just showing you sort of things with errors and this, you know, creating our own reader type to get around a problem. Um, but this is now the answer to, to, to day one. If we can run it like this, um, where we pipe the input in over standard in, we can also run it like this, where we give the input as a command line argument. And we have a nice little infrastructure set up for all the other days. And with that, I will sign off and uh, <laughs> let's see if anybody watches my first and probably terrible attempt to make a live stream. Uh, thanks.